Welcome to worship. Today is our second Sunday during Lent. Lent is a 40-day time period that leads us to Easter. It's a time of self-reflection and prayer. And so on Wednesdays, I invite you to join with me for a time of scripture and prayer at 7.30 each Wednesday, and we're going to be doing this through Zoom. I'm calling this the Lent Vespers. You will receive a link for this time in your email. During worship this Lent, we're studying the Ten Commandments and the history behind them and how Jesus spoke to them and also how they speak to us today. I'm using the book Words of Life by Adam Hamilton as our guide for this sermon series. Let us begin our time of worship by singing together, All Things Bright and Beautiful. of concerns that you'd like to share with your church, please get those to me by five o'clock each Tuesday. Let us go before our Lord in prayer. God, you have created us in your image. Help us to reflect your image to others through selfless love. Help us, God, to worship you and only you, not making things or other people the object of our worship. Help us to grow in faith even when we can't see or feel you. Accept our worship of you today as we give you all the glory and all the praise. Now let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is a kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Thank you for your continued tithes and offerings. As always, you can give by check or you can give online at lmcumc.org. Online, you can give a one-time gift or you can set it up so that you can give a gift each and every month uh, so that you don't actually even have to think about it or worry about it. The money just directly comes to the church. During Lent, I think it's an important time for us to remember what we believe as Christians. And so this Lent, uh, during each worship, we're going to be saying the Apostles' Creed. So let us say together this important creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we're going to be studying the second word given by God to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. Now remember from our sermon last week that God gave the Ten Commandments to the Israelites. Um, and the Israelites had blindly followed Moses out of slavery in Egypt into the wilderness. They had only known the life of a slave and the country that worshipped thousands of deities. The Israelite people had forgotten or simply didn't know of God's covenant promise with their ancestor Abraham. And here they are in the wilderness about three months after fleeing Egypt. Their guide and their leader is on top of this mountain and they are terrified as they see smoke and fire, having no idea what was actually going on up on the mountain. So on top of Mount Sinai, God gives Moses the second commandment. We find this in Exodus 24 through 5a. Do not make an idol for yourself, no form whatsoever, of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow down to them or worship them, because I, the Lord your God, am a passionate God. Now this commandment prohibits the worship of false idols, but it also prohibits the worshiping of idols that were intended to represent God. Now the Israelite people were accustomed to seeing the Egyptian deities, their false idols. It was part of the Egyptian religious life. The temples in ancient Egypt still stand today. They were built with one way in and the same way you came out. So just think of a long straight hallway. And as you walk down this hallway, you first would be in the large outer courtroom. And then the next uh, room you would go to would be the house of the deity. And then the furthest room in was uh, the throne room or the holy of holies. And there, seated or standing, you would find the house of the god or the deity that you had entered. The temple of Ramses II at Abu Simbel was a perfect example from the time of Moses. In the Holies of Holies, uh, Ramsay II, along with three uh, larger-than-life uh, deities or statues or idols, uh, sit in throne, waiting for the offerings and the prayers of the worshipers. The Pharaoh, during this time of history, was considered semi-divine in their lifetime, but was considered sacred in their death. The Egyptians believed that uh, these idols actually embodied the deities. The idols made their invisible gods visible. In addition to temple idols, people had small idols in their homes. These household gods are mentioned at least 10 times in the Old Testament. And the practice was common throughout the ancient world. 
I tell you all of this, the, how the temples were made and how it looks and the, the at-home deities, so that we can understand the religious life that the Israelites knew and the context to which God spoke to them the second commandment. After God spoke all the commandments to Moses, he remained on the mountain. So Moses remained on the mountain with God for an additional 40 days. 40 days also is the time period that Jesus was in the wilderness, fasting and praying and, and listening to God. And it's also the time period, as I said at the very beginning of the worship, uh, for Lent, our time of fasting and praying and waiting and listening to God. During these 40 days, Moses was up with God. The Israelites down around the mountain base became impatient. Exodus 32, 1 says this. The people saw that Moses was taking a long time to come down from the mountain. They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come on, make us gods who can lead us. As for this man, Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't have a clue what has happened to him. So Aaron was Moses' brother. The Israelites are stuck with him at the base of the mountain. And so they come to him and they say, make us something that represents God that we can actually see. And he thinks this is a great idea. So he tells them, gather the gold rings uh, from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. And so he takes all the gold and he forms it into a calf. The people then declare, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Take note that Aaron didn't make several images for God. He made one. And this makes clear that the golden calf was supposed to represent God, capital G, God, not multiple gods. Then Aaron built an altar in front of it, and they had a festival to the Lord. But this angered God, and so God sent Moses down the mountain, carrying with him the two tablets that had the Ten Commandments on it. Moses sees them dancing and carrying on and in, front of, um, in front of this statue, this idol, and he gets so upset that he throws down the Ten Commandment tablets, breaking them, and then he goes and he takes the golden calf and throws it in the fire, destroying it. When Moses, a little bit later, asks his brother Aaron, why did you do this? Aaron said that he was just doing what the people wanted. And also, Aaron said that he was sure that the Israelites would indeed follow God and could trust in God if they could actually see God. Now, as we read through the Old Testament, we can see that the Israelites continue to struggle with not being able to see God, as oftentimes we see them making a false idol or making something that does represent God, but God doesn't want that. God doesn't want them to do that. The second commandment prohibits the worship of false idols, but it also prohibits the worshiping of idols that were intended to represent God. Now, there are things that have been created to help us, um, to, to help represent God, such as a church building, such as a Bible, crosses, perhaps even candles. But over time, sometimes those things have taken the place of God in our hearts. Of course, we would never intentionally do that. In his book, Words of Life, by Adam Hamilton, he shares this story. I've known people who have come to worship their church buildings more than the God for whose worship they were built. I recall a community where a quaint Methodist church had stood for over a hundred years. It was old enough that it still had outhouses out back. And then an amazing thing happened. The little community became a suburb of a larger community. Thousands of new people came to live there. Uh, new neighborhoods sprung up and new schools were built. The bishop of uh, that area suggested that if the church wanted to reach the new people, the new neighbors, 
that the church should relocate about three miles east and create a space, of course with indoor plumbing, and also a place for children. But the congregation said no. The bishop pleaded with them, concerned that there was no church in the area at all, and that the people needed what the church could offer. The bishop even granted or gave them a grant uh, to be able to relocate so it wouldn't cost them hardly anything. But the people refused. Why did they refuse? Because they loved that old building. They had so many wonderful memories in it. And they liked the congregation the size that it was, with their closest friends sitting right next to them in their predictable pews. Perhaps it's too harsh to say that these people had made an idol of their church building and their worshiping community. But I think it helps us see a modern idol Christians sometimes worship. Even, unfortunately, the Bible has served as an idol to some Christians. God, of course, spoke to and through the authors of Scripture. And through them, by the Spirit, God continues to use those words to minister to us and to speak to us today. But sometimes Christians come to love their Bible or specific scriptures that heighten a certain topic more than God. I also know Christians who idolize politicians as if they are God. Jesus also talks a lot about money in scripture. Jesus says in Matthew 6.24, you cannot serve God and wealth. Jesus was speaking to first century peasants who struggled with making money an idol. Many people today in the 21st century have made money an idol as well. We know that from the second commandment that we are not to make idols or things that represent God. Yet the Bible does tell us that God made God's image visible in two ways. First, God made Jesus. Colossians 1.15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, John says it uh, in 1.14, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. A little later in John, Jesus says, the Father and I are one. Jesus, the incarnation of God, came to us in person as a reflection of the image of God. Second, we find the image of God in you and also in me. When we read Genesis 1:27, this seems pretty clear. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We all have been made in God's image and made to reflect God's glory. We reflect God's glory when we love God with all of our heart and when we love our neighbors. I want to share in conclusion one more story from the book Words of Life. Debbie is a member of the church I serve, writes Adam Hamilton, and she's also a cashier at a nearby grocery store. Not long ago, she told me that she had witnessed a miracle that week. A woman came to her register with a shopping cart full of food, her monthly grocery run. But as Debbie was ringing up the items, she noticed the woman began to set the items, a few items, back in her cart to return to the shelves. When Debbie hit the button, the total button, the bill was $250. Now, I don't know, I'm just interjecting here, I don't know if this woman had a family or if it was just her, but if she had a family and this was just her monthly grocery bill of $250, that's barely anything. For a family of four, we spent $250 every two weeks. So let's just put that into perspective. The woman, getting back to the story, handed Debbie her EBT, which is Electronic Benefit Transfer Card, 
provided by the state of Kansas to assist low-income um, people. The card indicated that she only had $188 on the card. And she, as she stood in line, she began to weep and apologizing and then started pulling things back to put away. Just then, the woman behind her spoke up and she said, please, let me buy your groceries this time. She gave her credit card to, the, to Debbie and she bought $250 worth of groceries for this other woman. When Debbie had finished charging the credit card, all three of them were crying. Hamilton goes on to say, I don't know if the woman who paid for the grocery, uh, the grocery bill was Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or an atheist. But what I do know is that in that moment, she reflected the image of God. She didn't know the woman she was helping but she showed compassion for her and did an act of pure grace. So don't make an idol. If you want to see God, look to Jesus. And don't forget that you were created in the image of God too. When you love your neighbors as yourself, others can see God in you. Amen. Let us close together with our hymn, Glorify Thy Name. God, look to Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord.